going to talk about giant in really big letters, uh, calcified thoracic disc herniation. So this should be fun. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uribe. Take it away. Okay. Thank you, guys. Uh, this is a great opportunity. Thank you to uh, Seattle Science Foundation TV, all the TBI crew, SASO, you name it, you know, all the big names we have in here today. So yeah, we're excited. And the, with the opportunity I have with me today, Dr. Coffey, that is one of our fellows, Dr. Farber, one of our senior residents, Dr. Gandhi, another fellow. And uh, basically we are going to show uh, really complicated, uh, I would say cases that uh, we as a spine surgeon, we hate it. You know, this is the kind of cases that you don't even want to refer to your best friend, you know, because you know what it takes. But no matter what, someone has to take care of them. And actually, there is a very nice way that we can handle it. And um, that's why we're excited today. So just going to start it. So uh, we know that what is actually definition called giant. And giant basically uh, come from a, actually a paper published on the late uh, 90s, early 2000 by Dr. Curtis Dickman. If you guys remember the senior surgeons in here that Dr. Dickman used to do a lot of endoscopic thoracic discectomies at the time of McAfee and uh, Reagan and all these guys. So uh, he is, they def define it, giant thoracic disc as uh, when the disc is more than 40% of the canal area. And the problem is, is when you talk about uh, thoracic disc herniations, actually there is many flavors and colors. And you know, you have to have into, into, into consideration the consistency is calcified or not, because as we know, it changes dramatically the, the approach. And also, what is the location on the spine? It's an upper thoracic, mid thoracic, and not only that, also geographically we located the central, paracentral, or exactly or foraminal. So uh, we found that you know through doing cases through through the years, we find out that sometimes it's hard to have a good communication with others when we are referring to uh, thoracic calcified discs, and uh, we're trying to find. Uh, you will see later on with Dr. Farber. Uh, trying to find a way that we find a common ground when we communicate with this one, similar with Dr. Sasso and you guys have been doing with some classifications. So this is the story with the thoracic disc. In general, we know that we can approach them from the front or from the back, anterior approaches or posterior approaches, yeah? So the more classic approaches are obviously the posterior one, you know, lateral extracavitary, the transpedicular, and the costal <coughs> transectomies. As we know, they're efficient, but soon, you know, but in some cases, you don't have direct vision of the disc. So you work kind of indirectly, you have to push away fragments with a curette, and you always like awaiting for the gash of CSF leak, or the CSF fluid coming out in front of you when you put these angle curettes and trying to, to push it in. And then on the other hand, we have the, I would say the more elegant approaches, which sometimes are more complicated, there are the anterior approaches. And, is the classic anterior, you know, thoracotomies where we get the access surgeon or the thoracic surgeon, takes the rib down, takes some time the diaphragm down, move the lungs away, deflate it, double tomb and all these things. And then um, you get to the spine in a more anterior way. You can control the pathology, I will say easier, but the problem with the true anterior approaches is that you, the last thing that you see is actually the problem. So you take most of the vertebra out, most of the disc out, and then finally you see the problem. The other option, which obviously I'm biased because this is what I, I love to do, is the lateral approach. And I'm gonna tell you what is to me the advantage. One is, you know, you do your approach by your own. You don't need the access surgeons. If you find the right plane, you do a retroplural and you don't need to deal with chest tubes and this and that. But what I like a lot is that you can control the, uh, not only the dura, the neural elements, but also you can see the actually the, the, the problem as you go and dissect it and find the problem. So that's another option. So anyway, so in here today, we're not gonna be biased and talking only about one single approach. Actually, the cases that we're going to demonstrate is you will see is in a very complicated pathology, how we can handle it. And most of the time, one approach is not the answer. And this is what, what we're going from there. So. So now what we're gonna do is, 
uh, Dr. Farber is going to show a little bit like what we are thinking that it should be the best way to communicate when we have thoracic disc herniations. And this one will include the giant thoracic discs. So I'm gonna put Dr. Farber in here. Uh, just come in here and keep, keep going with this. Hey, uh, good afternoon. Um, like Dr. Uribe said, my name is Harrison Farber. I'm one of his residents. So um, as he mentioned, um, there's really a lack of standardization uh, in the literature regarding descriptions of these lesions. And so um, our idea here is to create a more standardized mm -hmm. way of, of talking about thoracic disc herniations and then therefore hopefully um, helping us standardize the way we approach treating these lesions. Uh, so as we've kind of been mentioning, there's a lot of factors that you need to think about that'll affect your surgical plan. Uh, the consistency, like we said, whether or not it's hard, calcified, or if it's a soft disc herniation. Uh, the size being whether it's small or giant based on that uh, description of 40% uh, of the canal diameter. Uh, the central or paracentral location within the canal. Uh, the degree of spinal cord compression, so whether or not this is a, 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 a just an incidental finding with minimal uh, compression in the spinal cord or a patient with severe thoracic myelopathy obviously uh, dictates uh, two very different treatment approaches. And then lastly, the thoracic level. Um, certainly, uh, if it's an upper thoracic lesion uh, versus a mid to lower thoracic lesion, then uh, you may consider different treatment approaches. And uh, likely, most surgeons would say there's some level in the upper thoracic spine above which really uh, the posterior approach is going to be favored versus these other approaches Dr. Uribe was talking about. Uh, so here uh, is shown... Uh, uh, our proposed thoracic uh, disc classification with uh, five different types, which we'll go through individually. Uh, so the first is type zero, uh, which would be a thoracic disc herniation that does not cause uh, spinal cord compression in, in patients who are uh, uh, asymptomatic um, without any myelopathy. Uh, so uh, these would be uh, lesions that are found uh, perhaps on uh, uh, for patients getting imaged for other reasons, maybe for degenerative disease in the lumbar spine, and, and you see uh, these lesions in the, in the lower thoracic spine, uh, and likely would be ones that did not require operative treatment. Uh, type 1 herniations are paracentral. Uh, they're small, less than 40% of the canal diameter, uh, and uh, they're extradural. Whether or not they're uh, calcified, um, uh, would, uh, would determine whether or not they're soft, uh, a type 1S for being soft and a type 1C would be calcified as you can see here. Uh, type 2 disc herniation is central uh, within the spinal cord, uh, within the canal. So the compression uh, crosses midline and contacts both sides of the ventral spinal cord. Uh, also is extradural, uh, again, can be soft or calcified. Uh, type 3, and this is where the talk today will really focus, uh, is, are the giant uh, disc herniations. So greater than 40% of the canal diameter, uh, again, with uh, contact on both sides of the spinal cord uh, and extradural. Uh, these can be soft, which we've seen in our series, but, but many times these are calcified, which makes them very difficult to treat. Uh, and then the last type, uh, type 4 here, is actually a, a giant uh, central uh, calcified disc herniation that actually goes transdural uh, and, and oftentimes will cause significant deviation of the spinal cord uh, to one side. Uh, if they truly are transdural, then their treatment may require um, some sort of dural repair. Uh, so here's uh, just that, that first graphic showing uh, all types. Again, type zero being uh, asymptomatic with, yeah. with mild compression, uh, type one paracentral disc herniations, type two central small herniations, uh, type three uh, are giant central um, herniations, which are often calcified, and type four being those giant disc herniations that actually proceed to be transdural. Uh, so I think now we have some cases to show, uh, and I think these are really going to focus on these last two types here. Dr. Ziegler and Dr. Geiger and the you want to uh, discuss something about what we've been presenting. Well, is this classification system something you guys came up with or has this uh, been described? 
Yeah, so this is something that we are, act are actively working on. Uh, nothing really in the literature yet that that's sort of a standardized way of thinking about these. And so that's why we wanted to, uh, to create a way to, to bring some standardization to discuss, you know, how to describe them and, and ways to approach them. And Harrison, do you have any idea what the incidence um, of these are? Uh, that's a good are? question. Uh, uh, I don't know off the top of my head. There are, you know, uh, various series that have been published, like Dr. Rebe mentioned, Dr. Dickman uh, is one of the people who had a large series um, uh, from 10, 20 years ago. Uh, and, and we haven't, uh, you know, retrospectively gone back and reclassified those. So I, I don't know that answer right off the top of my head. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, all these required validation um, is, is, is not, uh, you know, yeah, it requires a creation, is not obviously still, you know, send it, no, we just send it for publication. We need to wait for the peer reviews. This is actually, the, it's actually the first time that we present, I would say we make it street legal so you guys can really <laughs> criticize. And I know that most of you guys uh, have your own classification and been part of uh, multiple things. So. Um, but which is interesting is that the reason that we end up with this is because every time I'm, I'm in a meeting and let's say I'm talking to Easy and I'm trying to tell him that I have an interesting thoracic disc herniation, I, you know, sometimes we don't communicate very easily. I say, well, I have a thoracic disc, uh, big thoracic disc calcification. I say, well, what I mean big, you know, is is more than 40%, less than 40%, is soft, is is hard. And then the, the other thing which is interesting is I think also this will also dictate what type of treatment you do, you know, and this is what becomes a little bit polemic when, when we show the cases, you know, because all of us in here had different ways to skin a cat. And um, so you tell me when you... Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah let's one, go. one, I <clears throat> I think that's a good idea that, you know, for example, the type four, you might say, well, this is the kind of case that we do this approach, this is preferred, and it'll help everybody else because you're right, there's very, you know, very little uniformity in terms of description. I mean, even the radiologists don't even know how to describe these. So if it can help the surgeon understand that what the options are for the approach and what is the best option, at least in your experience from your series. Yeah. Exactly, and, and the plan is um, more than anything help to, uh, as you say, not only communicate each other but also drive treatments. And you will see in the cases that we have, we're gonna show up three different uh, giant calcified discs, and we see where we can fit on the classification. But you will see actually the treatment on each one of them was actually different, so which is very interesting. All right, let's one. see some cases. Yes, easy. <laughs> Just want to make one, one other comment, Juan. When you look at this classification system, uh, one, two, and three, I think would be pretty easy to identify, sort out on the various MRI scans, plus or minus a CT. But I suspect between four and five, or the, sorry, the type three and four, your zero, one, two, and then your type three and four, I think that's going to be pretty hard. And there, there'll probably be a lot of inter-observer error in yeah. terms of classifying one versus the other. So I yeah. think you better look at that and find out the, or at least define more specifically what the real differences are between those two. Yeah, it's a good commentary, easy. And um, what we're finding here actually today, we're gonna show a type three and a type four. And with the way that we kind of differentiate it because it's hard is actually Basically, what I'm doing in my is my own practice is when I have one of these giant calcified discs, I just not walk away just with the MRI or the CT. I actually order a myelo CT, especially because to me it's very important to know if this herniation is like a mushroom type of like that or it's actually going through and through because that one is a totally different animal, you know. And the only way to see is sometimes with a myelo CT because the the disc is so big that you cannot even in a regular CT differentiate what is herniation, what is the cord, you know. Um, it's very interesting, you know. Um, I'm always fascinated with this pathology because it's very challenging. A lot of surgeons don't like to do it and they, you know, you guys are in big academic centers. They refer to us and someone has to deal with them. And uh, through the years, I became like a very um, excited with these cases. When I have one instead of, you know, I'm trying to find 
efficient way to do it. But Juan, can a, you explain again what the Milo CT tells you that the MRI doesn't? Uh, you know, I really like uh, to to have challenge like this, especially you know surgeries that the complication is not a food drop. You know, it's paralysis. Is you know, is we we know how complicated this case is. Can you, Juan? This is Scott. Can you explain again what a Milo CT tells you that a 2020 high Tesla MRI can't? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, I would say that uh, you would see in some cases is that when when I do the Milo CT, I can have a better definition of the dural sac. And you know, so you, you have a good idea where is it, you know? Uh, a lot of MRIs you're happy with, and I think you can walk away without it. But, um, one of those cases that I, one of those cases has a Milo CT or not? Okay, one of the, you can see one of these cases. Hopefully, we have that one that showed that you know you don't know exactly the disc is what is the core, what is the disc given on the MRI, and then you know you do look at the CT straightforward, and the straightforward CT just show you a big calcified area, but not a. So that's what I you know obviously is is the last test that we ordered the Milo CT. You know you go from the CT and uh, to me, CT, regular CT and MRI are most on these pathologies, you know. Um, but that's a good point, you know. Um, I'm not sure also if I get in this fancy MRI that you call Dr. Blumenthal. But um, well, one, the, the fact of the matter is there's tremendous variation in the quality of the MRIs. And unless it's at your institution, you don't have any control over it. You're on mute, Mon. Yeah, so, sometimes you're right. You're right. You know, sometimes you get at the mercy of whatever patients show up, with whatever images they show up, you know. And, um, so the question is, do you order another MRI or you go with the Milo CT, you know? So that's a good well, point, Dr. Gaia. You're helping me out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm behind you. <laughs> Yeah, I do. Just get a Milo CT, I think, uh, to see the calcification, extradural, uh, the intradural extension. That's uh, nothing like a, a good Milo CT to, to, uh, to decide. But I don't don't know about this uh, fantastic sequence, the fantastic MRI. Maybe, uh, but I should. I'd like to see the pictures. Another helper. Thank you, Dr. Arle. The old guys sticking together. Dr. Blumenthal, uh, you you have to say something about your fancy MRI. Well, well he's I talking about I, our three T. No, I think I think Rick brought brought the point up. I mean, if a patient gets referred in with a community MRI, sometimes those are very very poor quality, and certainly more anatomic delineation needs to occur. But you know, like he's like Rick also said, if it's your own institution and you've got a you know a high caliber MRI, you know. Probably enough. Done. So, um, yeah, so you want me to go with the first case? Sure. Yeah, this actually is a video, you know. Uh, the other ones are like a PowerPoint slide by a slide. This one is a video, we have it uh, somehow edited. So, you see here, this is a mid age uh, patient with a, um, a significant. Uh, herniated, calcified herniated disc on the mid thoracic area. As you see here on the initial picture, uh, definitely is taking more than 40% of that. And you see in this regular CT, uh, the cord seems like uh, is more on the uh, right side than on, when, you know, but the question is, do you have also cord on the left side? So, so this one is not as big as the one that you're gonna see. Let me see if we run the video that we can see. You guys can see the video, it's too much lag. Yes, no, no, we can see. So in this case, we approach it lateral, retropleural, you know, with a mini open thoracotomy. This one on the top of the screen is the anterior part. The lower part of the skin is posterior. And in here you see after you create the cavity anterior, uh, the, the dura is passing. Um, let me see if I can get in here with this thing. The, the dura is, is moving from left to right, and you see how we're thinning, thinning the, the herniated part. But at some point, as you see here, this little shell of bone that I'm trying to dissect didn't come out. But instead of having the CSF leak, what I did is 
Uh, let me see if I can get in here again. Oh my god, I need to escape out of this guy. I need to get out of the pen. How can I get out of the pen? Oh my god, this pen is driving me crazy now. <laughs> let me just escape. Just the see next see. <laughs> okay, now, now I'm good, I'm good now. <laughs> yeah. So if we get in here, let me just put in here at the end. At the very end. So in this case, what was interesting is, you see, you have a good management of the uh, Dura, which is going longitudinal left to right. And then this area, I was egg-shelling type of drilling as much. And I was trying right there to dissect it and take it out of the Dura. But obviously, it didn't want to come. So I said, instead of having a CSF leak into the retroplural space and the consequences, what I decided is I detach the herniation superior and inferior, medial and lateral, and you leave it like an island on there. You see here the post op CT, how this little shell is still there, but the, definitely the herniation move anterior. So this is, for example, one of the way to treat this giant calcified disc. And you see how the lateral axis actually part of the facet is removed posteriorly, as you see here, the entire pedicle. And you have a really good you know, control of the dura and the calcified lesion. So this is, I will say, the easy one of the three that we're showing, you know. This is a, a, a tumor that was more, not a tumor, uh, sorry, a herniation that was more paracentral, more on the left side. So that's why we were able to approach it from that side. So according to the Farber classification, what is this Farber? Uh, right. oh, that's a nice resection. Um, is, mm -hmm. is the inherent stability of the rib cage and the thoracic spine enough to not need to do a fusion with that much bony resection? That, that's a great point. And, and this has, you know, I went through, when I started doing these cases like this, I went through a lot of phases. The first cases, actually I was coming next day because this is a six, seven hour case, you know, and you're exhausted. So I used to go with next day and put pedicle screws, percutaneous, all these things, and then in my next phase, it's like, uh, this is too much. Then I was doing a lateral plate, and then I was putting cages and thing. And then one day I remember a patient that we did, we didn't, uh, you know, I was so tired. And then we said, you know, let's put a screws tomorrow. And then the patient decided not to have anything, not a second stage. We leave the patient alone and actually it did very good. So I can tell the last 20 cases or more than I've been doing like this, I just don't even put any instrumentation. I just leave some bone from the rib that I take and seems like at the ribs and the structural support of all the posterior elements intact, I still take care of that and I haven't have any problems, you know? Bad for the industry, you know, because we're not using the screws, plates and that, but, but I think it's good for the healthcare system and, and it tends to, to keep it together. No, if, you, if you've got a recent series of 20 of these without fusions, that's more experience than <laughs> Yeah. Anybody I know has. It. Yeah, and the thing is that I've been telling the resident that we should go and pull these cases in the long term because a lot of them has two, three years follow up, you know, showing that. I have one case which uh, asymmetrically collapsed, and I think what we, because of that and end up doing uh, posterior instrumentation after six weeks. But that one, we, you know, I think I took more than the pedicle. I took two pedicles, you know, so it's, it's too much, you know. I was too much, two pedicles in one side, so. Juan, can you carry us through your lateral extracavitary approach, the exposure, what, what your steps are to get down to that spot? Um, let's see if we have it in this video in here. Actually, I don't have it in this video. So, but I can tell you what are the steps is actually, we're trying to make it very standardized. Well, I don't have it in here, you know, because I was trying to show just the, 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 the calcium that, you know, the, the calcified, but I can tell you, uh, we ha I have like a very standardized at the, at, at the very last slides, I have a couple of uh, manuscripts where we've been publishing the technique step by step on videos and that, but basically is um, you put the patient on lateral, you find the target on the x-rays, and then you basically take, the first thing is, I, I know you guys remember when you're doing these cases with uh, thoracic surgeons, uh, it's like a 20 minutes before the surgery, they come very elegant and they start telling you, well, we have to take this rib down because we're going to T9, we're taking T7 rib and I have to mobilize the diaphragm, you know. I make it very simple. Whatever is on my way, that's the rib that comes out. Somebody, sometimes I have difficulty dictating what rib I took out, you know. So you take that piece of rib 
And then this is the, the trick is in the next step. You have to find this plane that is between the endothoracic fascia and the pleura. So when you take the rib, you know, six, seven centimeters of rib, you find that little plane and you start developing, you know? And the, the also another of the tricks in here is you have to go wide. You know, the wider you go, the more the pleura start moving forward. And you keep going in that space, you know, it's also called the extra salomic space until you find, like you see here, this is too late into the approach, but until you find in here, see in here, until you find the head of the rib, you know, the, this space, and you see here this, and then you take, you know, at, at this point, actually the, the pleura becomes your friend because you put these expandable two retractors and the pleura doesn't let the lung come in between. If you do in these cases, the regular thoracotomies, you know that the, the thoracic surgeon has to put a bunch of ratex and laps holding the lungs not to come together. In here, the pleura itself the became the natural barrier. And it's actually a very nice way to do it. You have to, you know, it, it has to be, you know, it has to be a little bit um, curious with the approach, but it works very good. But but I think is, you know, we, we should keep moving with the other cases because I'm not sure how with the time. I want to make sure that we have more time to discuss later on. Easy, you're okay with that? Yeah, no, that was a Absolutely. good discussion. Go ahead, yep. And okay. one, that floating approach is good for OPLL also sometimes because the OPLL becomes uh, part of the dura because it's such a chronic inflammatory process. Sometimes it's better to leave a little shell and just make it floating rather than try to dissect it off. Exactly, because sometimes it, the problem is, uh, Doctor, you know, sometimes, let's say, for example, uh, at this station here, yeah, right here, I'm, I'm having this little shell right there. You know, what's the point of me pulling this fragment out and having a big piece of CSF out when I can create this island and this thing by the pulsation later on, you know, you will see there is no more compression on there. So that, that's, that's the theory. So it's I good judgment. That. Yeah. Yeah. And this is another one in here just showing also, this was a soft, uh, just showing the pre and post. It's a soft, that sometimes you don't see this one. This is like a gift from God for us, you know. This is a soft, giant calcifying a young person. You open it up and you see here how nice is the result. You know, this is like a, those cases are, you see one in a hundred, you know. Soft, a giant calcified. But then let's go over Dr. Gandhi. So Dr. Gandhi, I'm going to stop sharing, sharing my screen and see if he can go and show his case. Now when does this thing become interesting, guys? So see what you guys think. I think you have the slides, is that right? Okay, yeah, so yeah, so I'm gonna go and you're gonna tell me next and next, okay? There we go. So this is your case. Perfect. So this is a patient that actually uh, uh, came to us from Texas. She was a, a nurse um, there, six year old, presenting with pain that really is, is very atypical, but she describes as pain radiating up from the side. Can you go back to the, the presentation? from the side of her thoracic spine and that's on, on one side of her body into the abdomens and down into the legs. She has no weakness, no numbness, no uh, real difficulty walking, no gait imbalance. And on, on exam, she's neurologically intact. So really it's just pain that, that, that uh, really caused her to get it worked up. And this is the MRI, next slide, that we saw uh, uh, when we saw her in the clinic. So this is a lesion that you see right there at, at the top level, that's T2, T3. On the axials, you see there's a giant herniation, and it's really even hard to see what is the spinal cord, what is CSF, what is part of the herniation, um, at, at right there exactly. So it's, it's, it, you, you can't tell where the spinal cord is. Is, is it transferred or is it pushed over to the right side, yes. to the left side? Um, really, what is going on? So yeah. that, and the so point, Sasan, and the point to to Doctor, you know, um, Blumenthal and our lead is where is the spinal cord in here you know this is the mri that we have you know is right here or is actually right here you know and when you look at the sagittal take a look at this guy it's going almost through and through yeah so that's why the ct might always perfect yeah exactly and this is the ct so, on this one so, so this is the cat scan of the patient presented with and you see calcified completely from the base of the vertebral bodies and you see from actually from the t2 and the t3 portions has a base there completely practically even touching the, the the dorsal portion of the lamina and you know on the cat scan it's really hard to see if you know where do you see any sort of a uh uh hyperdensity for or hyperdensity for where the spinal cord is so that's yeah, where we decided is the cord right here 
is the court right there. here or is actually the court draping all the way like this you right know? And she has no long track signs. She's neurologically intact. Neurologically, surprisingly, neuro she's still working as a nurse. Crazy. Yeah. All she had was pain. And, and we gave it the option. You said, listen, this is a very complicated high thoracic disease with a lot of morbidity. But she's like, no, I just cannot handle this pain. I, I, I take the risks, you know, and that then became our problem. Yeah? So the next slide, I think, shows the uh, CT myelogram that you see right there where the, the spinal cord is. And you see that the, that the spinal cord, we thought it was actually going to be shifted over to one side, but it's actually completely a spike of bone straight into the middle of the spinal cord and the spinal cord on either side of, of the herniation, making, you know, a, a what we initially thought was a type four, which this could still probably be uh, intradural component. But what we expected or what we would, what we would have liked to have done is do a transdural approach. But here it would be very difficult to do that essentially We'd have to be going through the through the uh, spinal cord itself. Yeah, you you don't want to go to the cord in here. You know that's the that's the value of the. You know this was a really bad boy. You know because uh, the the question is posterior approach is very limited. You know in terms of if you I mean you cannot go transdural for example. You know you still can go. You know obviously um, uh, lateral extracavitari transpedicular. Um, you still can go lateral. Yeah. Or well, even so, so, yeah. Exactly. So those were all the options. The problem here was, you know, trying to uh, do an anterior approach, you definitely have to do a massive uh, thoracotomy. You see where the, the great vessels are. Um, it's a very close to, uh, uh, you have to get the heart mobilized. It, and it just would be a, a massive surgery. Well, a lateral you approach. T2, T3? No, you, you had T2, T2, T3. T2, T3. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So. And then a lateral approach. With the uh, the shoulder and, and the scapula in the way, you, you you just cannot get the lateral approach that that the previous case uh, we showed. Yeah. Lateral is not an option, you know, because you have the axilla, the you know some parts of the of the brachial plexus. So lateral is not an option in here. Okay. Anterior, I mean, you have to make like a one of those go Kaslan, you know, heroic thing that you split the patient in half, move the the heart, you know, you just have a tour for the entire chest. And the mediastinum, and finally you get into this better, and then what you know, and then what you do, you know. I mean, then you can do your job. But. I have a question to, do, do, for this guy cases where it's uh, uh, intra drawer, and do you get a normal drain before you start the surgery? Because uh, I mean, uh, likely you're gonna get uh, some, some leak. Yeah. No. Personally, I, I prefer to wait if they, we really go because my plan usually is trying to stay away, you know, from the dural leak as much as possible. Obviously, if you have it, then, you know, patients show up out of the room without, with the lumbar drain, but, um, so, now, so the plan- A couple of occasions have put it to the prophylactically before and then remove it at the end of the case. Yeah. Like this, uh, like this, if I had one, and just, it was easy to open the drain. Yeah, it could be an option, yeah. Um, so the and question I, I guess, is- I guess a part of that really comes down to what, uh, the goal of your surgery is, you know, are you trying to go for a complete resection of this calcification or are you going to settle for something that, that what we showed in the previous uh, case where we decompress, uh, allow for that fragment to, or as much of the fragment to be taken out and then just allow for indirect decompression and allow for that the calcification to float back into the void you've created and, and, and then let the spinal cord really drift away. Because even here, there's, there's, if, you're, if we're trying to go for a complete resection, even from a posterior approach, this would be, there's going to be components of the surgery where it's going to be done essentially blind because there's no way for us for you to see up ventrally uh, 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 up into the spinal cord. So, so the question in here for you guys is, I wanted to know from the other panelists what <coughs> approach will you guys go? You guys can just go and say anterior, posterior, lateral, or nothing. So one, you you can do this from a transthoracic approach, you have to do it from the right side, a scapular mobilizing approach and access the uh, T3 rib head. In fact, I did this on a young uh, wrestler uh, last year and he was back wrestling very, wow. very, very, very quickly. But it is, you need to understand how to mobilize a scapula because you're right, it is difficult to get there and it has to all be done from the right side. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. Um, yeah, so um, 
So, oh my God. Okay, so so Shashank, you want to keep going with the case? Yeah. So so exactly what we talked about. The different approaches. The anterior approach really requires a massive mobilization of all the you know thoracic uh, uh, organs and vessels. An integral component. How do we assess that? Do we do we do we actually aim to resect it, resect the internal component, or do we just uh, live with uh, ha having a remnant behind? So <clears throat> this was our approach. Um, this, this, we use navigation uh, to really localize uh, wh where we were and, and find exactly what bony uh, structures we needed to resect. <clears throat> and our approach was to go posterior, essentially a, a lateral cavitary approach to resect a large portion of the ribs bilaterally take the, uh, the TP and the pedicles down completely uh, um, at the, the T2 and the, T, and the T3 levels. So essentially now we, we were able to see all four nerve roots, bilateral T2 nerve roots, bilateral T3 nerve roots, and you can see the pleura uh, where, where the ribs were resected. And if you follow the, where the rib heads would attach to the vertebral bodies, we essentially drilled a void into the T2 and the T3 vertebral bodies um, above and below. So, so, so releasing the calcifications uh, superiorly and inferiorly, and then drilled across midline, allowing for uh, us to work by pushing the, the pleura down and essentially uh, de uh, detach the entire calcification uh, uh, in, from the midline also, creating this floating island. Um, and I think someone had asked, do we do a complete ver vertebral column resection? And we did not. We, we, we only created a void large enough for uh, that fragment to float down. So as much of, of that calcification we could, we, could, we could easily drill and see, we would drill. And then one of the key, key uh, I think, learning points for me was, when Dr. Uribe says, you know, all life he, he kept telling himself, you know, resist the urge of trying to pull this calcification down. You know, that there's going to be this point in the surgery where, where you think you, you, you've gotten it, but then, you know, when you pull it down, a couple of things can happen. You can have a massive CSF leak or you're going to lose your, your, your potentials, you know, and, and, and really one of the things is, you know, you, you have to kind of settle for that indirect decompression. The spinal cord is already going to drift back because of the wide decompression that is done uh, dorsally and then allowing for the calcification to uh, drift anteriorly and then eventually with the CSF pulsations, the, the, there will be enough uh, uh, decompression of the cord. So, so the idea was to create an, an island similar to the Oron, but in a different scale. And also I was telling the fellows, you know, you always have this temptation to pull out. And, but the problem is, this is a woman that has not even myelopathy. He's working as a nurse. I mean, can you imagine this woman get out of here? You know, you would then tire this out and then the woman with, with you no know, paralysis or something like that. You know, anterior spinal artery is gonna be intimately attached to this, who knows, you know. Uh, these are easily you can have a vascular injury. So um, I was thinking that probably in this case, the best way was um, create an island and detach the, the herniation from every corner and see creating a void in the front, the pulsation can help us out. And, and, and that basically the, uh, did you see here? This is basically um, what what we did. You see here the axial CT pre-op and the axial CT post-op. So you see here, if you measure the, uh, the 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 distance between the posterior edge and where the spinal cord is in the middle. So definitely, you know, we create some room for the for the dura to and the, the spinal cord to live. You know, and the patient went home happy moving everything and we expected that that creating this gap in here this cavity that is alone it will let this fragment to pulsate and hopefully you know it's not and and also I was trying to tell the resident what can we put there so this thing doesn't fuse again you know like a, can we put something that actually never fuses because if this thing fuses anterior then the problem re coexist so we like this case because, you know, you guys has a lot of experience. I wanted to know how you will do it different or you will do another thing. And um, I want to hear, you know, we want to hear from, from you, you know, and also if, if um, um, what, what you, you know, what are your consideration of this? One, I had uh, two, two questions to ask. Uh, I know you're a big fan of the ultrasonic technology. Did you use the ultrasonic bone hook at all in something like this? 
Gandhi, I'm, yeah, he can tell you. So we did. We 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 used it yeah. to make to help with our cuts uh, into the vertebral body. Yeah, we, we made uh, the cuts. You know, like when we made the cuts, meeting from you know, we take some of the pedicles down, obviously with this. But then when we made the cuts on the front, you know, it's basically a glorified PSO partial corpectomy that we're doing. We just make sure that we go through and through when the dura is not attached to the uh, uh, posterior longitudinal ligament and cut it both sides and. Just by taking both pedicles, we leave these things alone. But yeah, we, we found very useful the mysonics. You know, I mean, sorry, the, the bone scalpel. Sorry about the commercial name. But we use it for these cuts, you know, like the, the parallel to the dura, they're amazing. They just go like this, you know, and they're so nice. I mean, you, you use a lot this bone scalpel. Yeah, and I think you guys on the on uh, Texas Back Institute use it a lot as well, correct? Yeah, I found the the hook particularly useful for these transthoracic extracavitary decompressions where you're working underneath the dura. The other question I wanted to ask you is with respect to a reperfusion syndrome, uh, especially with a spinal cord that's compressed like this. Have, have you had much issue with that? Have you seen a lot of that? Is that something that we should be worrying about? And um, if so, how do you avoid it? Yeah, so what we do is, obviously these patients, when they go out of the OR, they, we treat them as a spinal cord injury patients, you know, and even if they don't have deficit, we increase the mean arterial pressures. We keep a really good perfusion the first 24 hours, you know, we artificially, you know, we use uh, um, uh, blood um, increasing agents, you know, to like a dopamine or whatever to keep it, you know, a good means. And, um, you know, because we're afraid, as you say, that this can happen. The other thing that we see sometimes, you know, as a neurosurgeon, on um, uh, arteriovenous malformations, and that is like a, when you take this compression, there is a luxury perfusion, you know? So vessels that are marginally uh, voided of some flow, suddenly they open up. And as, as you mentioned, that's a really good point. Sometimes also when you look at the MRI, the problem on this one, we don't see good, you know, good images because but then right away you see all these changes on the spinal cord that sometimes you question yourself where they're just uh, because of the previous compression and, and cord damage or is actually, you know, uh, edema and changes just because of the decompression. But that's Juan, a good question. Juan, have you ever done any long-term follow-up CTs in these patients to see what happens with that bone island? In other words, does it float further? Does it resorb or does it reattach as you mentioned earlier? I, the problem, Dr. Goyer, is I don't have volume. You know, these are very unique patients, you know, and, and sometimes these people also are travelers. You know, they come from other states. are hard to keep up with them. So this woman, for example, from Oklahoma, I'm, I'm begging her to do a CT, you know, or an MRI later on. Um, I don't, to be honest, I don't have a good follow-up long-term on these cases. We have, in, you know, the, what you see here, that is the first three days, but, but after that, we just get, they just send x-rays, make sure that it's not unstable, and these are that. That's what I can say, that they don't fall apart. You know, the other ones that we do retroplura, but in here, I would love to see, because to be honest, I don't know what is the, what means the long-term on these patients. Juan, I think the, the good lesson that you've shown for the residents and the fellows is you have to have restraint and not try to be a hero. Uh, we, we used to say at Rancho, it's hard to make someone better than neurologically intact. You know, So here you're starting with someone who's normal and you certainly don't wanna give them a spinal cord injury. But even if this patient had an incomplete uh, uh, syndrome, um, you know, you could make that patient worse uh, by trying to make a good x-ray. So I, I think that's a, that's a very good lesson from a senior surgeon. Thank you. That's a really good point, Dr. Siegler. Yeah, and that's, you know, and it's very hard when you see a patient driving into the hospital, get out of the hospital in a wheelchair and you know that will never walk again, you know. That's, that's not a good one, yeah? So, yeah, so you guys are okay. We're gonna, Dr. Koff is gonna show his case. That's, this one is a very interesting one also. Great. <laughs> All right, this hopefully will complete our musical chairs. Um, let's take it. Okay, so um, this case is a 65 year old woman who initially presented with gait instability and some burning sensation in the leg. Uh, she had tried multiple things to get rid of it and it didn't get any better and ultimately ended up seeing us here at the Barrow. Um, on exam, 
the patient had full strength in all extremities, but ha had bilateral clonus. So this one had myelopathy on presentation. Uh, this is the initial CT scan that we got. Uh, the patient has a giant calcified thoracic disc at T10, T11, uh, which appears to be on one side of the canal. On the MRI, we see that uh, the patient has uh, this, what looks like the cord displaced to the left side and um, the calcified herniation on the right side here. Um, and then, and so in this case, we thought it was clear enough to actually see the cord and we knew that it was displaced in one way or the other. But, uh, and so we did not think that a CT myelogram was indicated here. Um, you can press and you can draw it. Okay. Right, right. Dr. Yurde wants me to draw this for you. I think uh, that's very, so this will be the spinal cord here. And in the upper cuts, you can kind of see it here as well. And so the, the disc herniation here has displaced the cord to one side, but it comes very superficially, uh, unlike the other one where the cord was actually draped on it. So this would fall as a type four classification based on, on the classification Absolutely. system that we are using, which will make it transdural. Uh, <laughs> So what are your thoughts in terms of operative approaches that one will address um, this pathology? Why would you call that transdural? Yeah. How do you know it's transdural? You yeah. will see it. You will see it. That's, <laughs> very, that's a very good question, Dr. <laughs> yeah. it's, uh It's based on the MRI alone, yeah, I mean, you cannot determine whether it's transdural or not. But interoperatively, it's very clear. Yeah, I mean, in the, the MRI, it's, like it's almost touching the lamina on the other side. It's like a through and through. This, you know, um, is you know, obviously, you don't have a hundred percent the the answer until you, you know, you, you right, know right. Answer. Okay. Um, Take a look at the CT. Show the CT. So this here is the CT, CT again. I mean, there is no room for anything there, yeah? I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing how this thing grows and um, the only way to grow is probably through and through. I mean, but let, let's see, you know, uh, to be honest, microscopically, probably you still have some dura anteriorly pushed through the years through it, you know? Uh, but you, I don't know, you want to show in the next slides. And right, so I'm gonna just go ahead. Things. So. Uh, so this is a video of uh, what we ultimately yeah, did. Escape. Okay. So escape. And... Okay, so with this, uh, you have to open the dura to really understand the pathology. So a midline approach posterior. No? Yep, uh, I'll stop there for a minute. So first you do a, uh, a laminectomy, bilateral phasectectomy and then take down the pedicles on both sides to get good access to the dura on both sides of the cord. And then you'll, uh, you open the dura and identify the lesion. So in this part of the video, the dura has been opened and uh, this area is where the calcification will be. Then uh, you resect the dentate ligament uh, to really allow you to mobilize the cord. And so now I'll play the video further, that's been done. And so let me stop it again here. This is now the calcified disc and the cord is here. There is no real clear plane between the disc and the cord. So you have to navigate along the dura to understand that uh, the relationship of this calcified disc in the dura. And then I'll go again. So now that's being done here. Once you have a, uh, the, the calcified area really delineated you can then treat this like you would a meningioma. You see, You'll, Dr. Sasso, it looks like an intradura, no? Absolutely, it's intradural. But my question is, how did you know that before the operation? You would never know. It's technically impossible to know. 
Okay, so I'll just keep going. So here you can see an ultrasonic aspiration of the calcified component of the herniation and really coring out the, the lesion completely with a high speed drill as well. And then once you create a good decompression of this uh, lesion, you can start to dissect it along from the cord. And here, I'll pause this for a second. So this blue thing here is literally a piece of seven and a half glove that has been resected to really create a barrier between the cord and the calcified lesion. So when you are drilling, you don't accidentally drill a portion of the cord and cause a big mess. So, uh, and then we keep going. So you drill some more, you take down a lot of the internal component and really carefully drill closer and closer to the cord. And then you separate the so lesion. Keeping, are you keeping an eggshell of the calcified fragment um, yes. between you and the cord? That's a, yes, that's absolutely right, Dr. Ziegler. You, you have to because uh, removing that, there's really no plane there. And so you can't really take everything away from the cord without injuring the cord. Um, and uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uribe wanted me to let you know in terms of one of the reasons why he felt that we should cut the dentate ligament, it allows you to mobilize the cord and gives you that room to actually do the dissection that we did earlier to get a plane between this calcified disc and the cord. Okay, so uh, so that's it. The cord is now released from the compression and you, decomp you really debulk everything like you're doing a thoracic meningioma and then you have this void and then you leave a shell of bone which comes from the calcified herniation attached to the cord and close the dura like you would from a tumor. Okay, so Dr. Kofi, that's beautiful. That was really, really nice. It, just like an intradural tumor, you, you took care of that. But let me ask you this. What if you did that and you found out that that was actually extradural? Right, if, if it was extradural, when you really do your bilateral pedicle subtraction, you'll be able to see it clearly and you will have no reason to open the dura. So by doing your pedicle subtraction, you would see the lesion before making the determination whether a dural opening is necessary. Uh, and the other thing- Okay, very you nice, can, very you nice. You can put your finger and you can feel the, the herniation, you know, that's, that's touching very, very gentle the dura. Sometimes we use ultrasound also, you know, I can give you an idea where, where are you at, but. Uh, what Dr. Coffey mentioned is very interesting that uh, that uh, at this point we say there is no disc outside in here. It has to be inside. And um, as you saw there, it was almost no dura from the other side. The disc was itself. And uh, the other thing is what we mentioned is something that we do a lot on, on the spinal cord uh, tumors is that it's very important to cut the dentate ligaments because it lets you rotate the cord, you know, it, it takes more, more uh, freedom for you to manipulate it. And I just show, and then the closure is another thing that we, we, we like to uh, share with you is we've been having a really good uh, results closing the dura, um, you can show there, using a Gore-Tex suture, you know, tends to hug the dura very nice and keep it watertight, uh, which works very good because of the closure. So, um, but that's, that's the, uh, though this is a truly, I would think in Tradura, you see there, um, the uh, lesions. And then also again, easy, we're using the ultrasonic. In this case, we use it not only to uh, decompress, you know, excor the lesion, but also we use it to, you know, to the other parts of the, of, you know, the ultrasonic uh, bone scalpel for that. And, now, Juan, one, one, one of the, one of the uh, participants asked whether or not the eggshell will collapse with time if you left a little shell of bone in there. Will that collapse? Yeah, that will be also... Uh, the, the thing is that you have to release it 100% of the front, you know, because if not, you're going to still keep this heel, you know, in, in there. So that's why we were trying to eggshell out as much as possible and then break it. You see in there, what is the rest of the... On this, on the CT, this is the post-op CT. So you see how much we were able to take a lot of that disc out, and um, so you can see there is an eggshell of this calcified disc attached to 
yeah. uh, on the cord and so forth, which was not removed at the yeah, time. Because so we don't want anterior leak also. You get too crazy anterior, then you create an anterior <coughs> leak, you know? So we want the disc itself to, to um, seal it from the front. Right. So that's what we have. I and mean, here's the MRI post-op and the patient did very well. Uh, the myelopathy in this patient ultimately has resolved and we've been following this patient very closely. So, so the next one, the next one, okay. And then, you know, for the uh, for the audience, you know, the one before, we, we have this, this paper actually has a really good video describing step-by-step -step the retroplural approach. Uh, something that actually and we enjoy a lot to do it and then go to the next one. And then these other ones also have a good description of that, that Easy was asking on it. Uh, so now we open for, for any uh, discussion you guys wanted to talk. You think we still have five, six minutes or something? Juan, how do you handle ventral dural tears? Huh. That's a torture. The only thing that we do is we create like a, like a sling, you know? And what we do basically is we hug the entire dura and then we suture on the on the on the posterior part. I mean when we do a posterior approach, yeah. When we do an anterior approach, this is one, let's say for example, that case you have an anterior dura leak. So what we do is we hug the entire dura with a with a piece of, you know, like a uh, the, you know, that's synthetic dura or uh, dura, what's the name? Dura. Do that again, one of these, and then we suture, and then we create like a slip. But that's when you go posterior. When you go anterior, easy. Uh, where is you know there is not too many opportunity to suture. You know, suture is very hard there. You know, uh, what what I do is, which you know, besides trying at any cost to avoid it, is, uh, and this is only cases that I use lateral plates. What I do is, the void that I have there from anterior. I put a lot of, you know, um, um, you know, fibrin glue or the commercial available, a lot of, you know, flow seal uh, gel foams. And then what I do is I put a plate on the top of that, you know, going from lateral, holding all that material. That way it doesn't go out. And then, you know, lumbar drain, as uh, Dr. Arlette mentioned, and then you keep a lumbar drain for five days and then cross your fingers, you know. That's basically. Okay. Oh, wow, that was quite that was quite a series of cases. Unbelievable. We, I, we love them, you know. We, we just get nobody wants to treat it around the area, you know. So we and these people really want some results. And as I told you, we try and how can we treat them without giving paralysis? The question is, I mean, I'm sure there is other ways to do it, probably better, but that's why we like to, you know put it on the, you know, present it to the community and you guys help us out to define this and yeah. Yeah, good, technically challenging, but also good uh, surgical judgment, good thinking and, and figuring out the safest way to do it for the patient. So thank you for sharing that. Dr. Blumenthal, sorry he lost that patient from Texas. <laughs> yeah, Scott would have operated on him. <laughs> How they put on artificial disc in them. Guys, so hard, Dr. Bloom. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, uh, thoracics have been, thoracics were, were something of the past for me. So, yes, glad you were able to take care of it. And don't give up on the Myler CT, despite what Scott says. I didn't say give up on it. I just asked a question, an academic question for the 114 other participants on this, on this call. <laughs> Uh, thank you guys very much for doing it. That was one of our uh, one of our great conferences. We appreciate it. Really, really good job. Thank you. Thanks for your well. guys. Hey, thanks, guys. Thanks to all the residents too. Thank you. Bye thank bye. You. Bye. Thank you. You guys bye. Job. Bye. Thank you, Rebo. Thank you, Hero. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Remember to claim your CME. Yes, Linda. <laughs> yes, mom. <laughs> you all are very good at it. I do. Yes. <laughs> Hi, Linda. Great job. Thank you, guys. Linda Thank and Megan. Take care. Bye bye. Please. See bye -bye. you Friday. See you. See you Friday. Okie okay, doke. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Blumenthal. Thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button for more medical content.